painters have been trying to figure out color since painting first started. Um, in 1692, a Dutch artist named A. Bugert sat down to create a book um, about mixing watercolors, and the result is this amazing 800-page guide to mixing hues um, that is just a stunning work of art. Then in the 19th century, a man named Werner wrote the, the guide to colors that was adapted for um, zoology, botany, chemistry, mineralogy, and anthropology and anatomy. Um, and it's a preeminent guide to color and it's classified for artists, scientists, naturalists, and it gave all these handwritten details of describing where each shade could be found on an animal, plant, or mineral. It's like an amazing book. Um, Prussian blue, for instance, could be located on the beauty spot of a mallard's wing um, or a piece of blue copper ore. So it's really gorgeous. Um, and then that was kind of exploration was happening. Then the Renaissance artists who were also beginning to build on the laws of perspective and shading were also super interested in understanding how color and its properties could be used to better explore in their, in their world. Um, and then when we, in our youth, we all learned about the color wheel and the, the colors of the rainbows. And when we were growing up, you know, that was what was taught. Um, and kind of the very traditional um, ROI, GBIV, all the colors of the light spectrum. And, you know, even though the color wheels I gave to you are great tools, they don't really explore all the things that are happening when it comes to color and what the eye is seeing. But recently there's been a lot of interesting scientific work. Um, in fact, in 1981, these men, David Hubble and Torsten Weasel, won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for their discoveries concerning information processing in the visual system. And that's really changed the way we look at image processing and color. Um, which is why people are looking for new ways to show what color looks like. This is um, the cal it's called the color gamut, and it was designed by an illustration professor and a physicist, and it tries to express color in a more complicated way, involving um, wavelength, chroma, measurements, and stuff. So instead of saying something looks bright green, you might say it's 145 degrees, it's 53 plus, and it's 50 percent. So it's a really interesting um, way. Science has always impacted art. Um, without the lithograph, we wouldn't have had any Daumier prints. Um, without the invention of a collapsible metal tubes in 1841, which replaced animal bladders for carrying ready-to-mix oil paint, people wouldn't be able to paint, paint outside and we wouldn't have Impressionism. Um, without polymer paints and an overhead projector, we wouldn't have Andy Warhol. Um, you know, we wouldn't have had uh, without a photocopier, we wouldn't have had David Hockney's series, um, Homemade Prints from 1968, which, you know, he just used a photocopier. So science has always really impacted art. And what we're seeing now is how much neurobiology is impacting art. So let's look at what scientists currently think is happening in our eyeballs and our brains when we see color in the world. Um, just so you don't think I'm too smart, most of this comes from a book called Vision and Art. The Biology of Scene by a woman named Margaret Livingston, who's a neurobiology professor at Harvard. So basically, our eyes are cones and rods. The rods are sensitive to light and dark changes shape and movement, which is basically luminescence. In a, in, a dim, in a dark room, we use our rods, but we are colorblind. Cones, on the other hand, are sensitive to one of three colors, um, green, red, or blue. And according to Livingston, cones and rods are as anatomically distinct as vision is from hearing. And in fact, primates are the only ones, primates are the only animals that see in color. Everybody else just sees light and luminescence. But what's interesting is that the brain is split into as well. And the part of the brain that sees under moonlight is the same part of the brain that sees movement, depth, value, and luminosity. Then the part of the brain that that part doesn't see color. Um, and then the other part, it sees color. So it's, it's exactly kind of like our optics, which is super interesting. So let's go through just a few basic facts about what color is. Um, the color we see depends on the quality of light, if the light is reflected, and where the light source is. And we don't see color in dark because there is no light to hit the object in the dark. Um, and the view of color has to be processed by our brain just as it has to be processed by our eyes, and that's called perceived color. Then there's also the type of color that our brain believes to associate with an object. So it's like a preconceived color. So like when we see a lemon, our brain perceives it and processes it as, as yellow because our brain knows it's, it's a lemon and all the other lemons in our life have been yellow, so the, bros, the, the brain processes it yellow. So we're going to talk about luminance versus hue. So luminance is, is the measure of the perceived brightness of a color. Um, when a 3D object is illuminated, different parts of its surface 
reflect different amounts of life depending on the angle of the light. Um, in this, this next graph compares the luminance of a hue to the hue we see. So on the left is the luminance scale, on the right is the color. So you see the yellow has a very high luminance, almost white, versus the blue is, is a very low luminance. So, um, and luminance depends on hue, but it also depends on saturation. So if you reduce the saturation level, if you, how much pigment is in the color, it will reduce the luminance respectively. Um, knowing luminance means that you know the amount of contrast, and contrast is really important. Contrast is actually more important than hue and saturation because of the three properties, hue, saturation, value, value, which is the contrast, is how we see the form and depth of something. And that's value is what makes the shadows on a surface. So I think the best way, if you look at these, you can see the, the folds of her fabric. There's depth there. Um, there's light and shadow, and that's the luminance, and that, that is what gives it such beautiful light and depth. Um, a better way to show it is if you look at these three spheres, the one on the left is shaded with value and, and that has depth. Um, but if you look at the one on the right with color, even though it should be what we think of as value shifts in color, because the luminance is off, it's a totally flat 2D thing. So it doesn't have luminance, it only has a shift in, in hue. Um, luminance can also be used to really kind of trick the eye and trick the mind into and having a vibrant thing. So in this Monet um, Impression Sunrise, if you look at the one on the left, the, the real painting, um, there's that incredible sun in there. It's like super vibrant and vibrating, and it creates the whole focal point of the painting. If you look at the grayscale version of it on the right, there is no, there is no sun, because actually, in all actuality, um, the sun is the exact same luminance as the sky surrounding it, which you would never guess if you just went on the color alone. So what's happening, and that's really interesting, is the part of your brain that sees luminance um, doesn't see it, but the part of your brain that sees color does. So it creates this crazy, intense energy and awesome vibrancy. And luminosity was also impacting what Jerome were doing, because they discovered that you could get value and depth across without just adding white to everything. Then they were free to paint a, a face blue with red highlights, and it opened up a whole new world in expressionism. Um, and they realized if luminous was correct, they could portray a 3D shape. And this meant that the ability to create the world around them with more expression and heart and soul was open. So cracking the luminous code was a big deal. So bringing this information to today, we're going to take our still life and do three different stages of color work. Okay, stage one, we're going to block in the color. We'll pick the local color to each object which is local color means the color of an object in natural light when it isn't reflecting another color of the object around it. And we won't add any lighter color, just a silhouette of the shape. Um, stage two, we're going to do perceived color, um, which is this second pass. We're going to go back and paint the perceived color, more subtle changes that result from the light and um, the effect of the color surrounding it. And then stage three, we're going to do pictorial color. We're going to look at what we have and see how can we make this more harmonious or more drama or add a focal point. Um, so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to use our basic information on luminosity and color and paint. See you tonight. Thanks.